John Dickinson. I'm sure when I say that name, the first question that comes to mind is, who's John Dickinson? Well, John Dickinson was an influential founding father, so influential that his nickname was Penman of the Revolution. You don't believe me? Check this out. Yeah, pretty cool, huh? So how come no one knows who he is today? Well, stay tuned and you'll find out. You'll probably find out some other cool stuff too. I hope. John Dickinson was born November 13th, 1732 in Alabama. No, not that Alabama. This one, in Talbot County, province of Maryland. He did not live there long, however. His father, Samuel Dickinson, purchased over 3,000 acres, that's got to be at least one football field, of property from his cousin in the Kent County area of Delaware. There, he established another plantation. Yes, he owned slaves. He named this plantation Poplar Hall. This place right behind me. Samuel Dickinson was a leading community figure. He was a judge for the, the Court of Common Pleas of Kent County, so it was extremely important for him to get around fast, hence the prime real estate of this area. This plantation is built from the St. Jones River to the Delaware Bay, meaning that Samuel Dickinson and, by extension, John Dickinson's family, could get to Delaware's capital, Dover, much faster than riding miles of crappy dirt roads and trails on foot or horseback. John Dickinson was educated at home. The major influencers that would shape young John's future were Francis Olson, a Presbyterian minister who would later establish the New London Academy in Pennsylvania, William Killen, who became a lifelong friend and who would later become Delaware's first Chief Justice and Chancellor, and, of course, John's family. At the ripe age of 18, John began to study law, and by 1753, he was off to London for three years to study at Middle Temple. In 1757, he was admitted to the Pennsylvania Bar, beginning his career as a barrister and solicitor. Solicitor a British lawyer who advises clients, represents them in lower courts, and prepares cases for barristers to try in higher courts. The Townsend Acts were a series of British Acts of Parliament passed during 1767 and 1768, introducing a series of taxes and regulations to fund the administration of the British colonies in North America. This was due to the fact that the British, and by extension, the American colonies, had just finished fighting an expensive war by the kind of confusing name the French and Indian War. In 1763, the French and Indian War is the name given to the North American part of the larger Seven Years' War. The French and their American Indian allies were pinned against the British and their own American Indian allies. So it was not just a war fought between the French and the Indians. Sorry. Well, our friend John Dickinson did not like this one bit. He published... Letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania. These letters laid out a clear legal argument that the British Parliament did have the authority to regulate colonial trade, but it did not have the authority to raise revenue from the colonies. These letters would later become one of the most influential American political documents prior to the Revolution. Extremely popular. Dickinson was one of the delegates from Pennsylvania to the First Continental Congress in 1774 and the Second Continental Congress in 1775 and 1776. Dickinson wrote the Olive Branch Petition as the Second Continental Congress's last attempt for peace with Britain. John's main goal was reconciliation with Britain, not independence and revolution. Hence why he's not so popular today.
his position would further become in the minority in 1775. Why? Dickinson's position is displayed quite well in the HBO series John Adams. He argues that by the 13 colonies declaring independence, they would be unable to secede on their own. They will need the assistance of other nations, thus making them indebted and under the immense influence of another nation from the very moment of winning their freedom from Britain, essentially trading one colonial overlord for another. When the Continental Congress began the debate on the Declaration of Independence on July 1st, 1776, Dickinson again stated his opposition to declaring independence at the time. Dickinson believed that the Congress should complete the Articles of Confederation and secure a foreign alliance before issuing a declaration. Dickinson also objected to violence as a means for resolving the dispute. This is most likely tied to his religious background. Quakerism heavily shaped his political and personal views. He abstained from voting on July 2nd and abstained again from voting on the wording of the formal declaration on July 4th. Dickinson understood the implications of his refusal to vote, stating, My conduct this day, I expect, will give the finishing blow to my once too great and my integrity considered now too diminished popularity. Dickinson refused to sign the declaration, and since a proposal had been brought forth and carried that stated, For our mutual security and protection, no man can remain in the Congress without signing. Dickinson voluntarily left and joined the Pennsylvania militia. At this time, one would be right to assume that John was pretty much the outcast. However, his contemporaries did have respect for him. John Adams, a fierce advocate for independence and Dickinson's made adversary on the floor of Congress, remarked, Mr. Dickinson's alarity and spirit certainly become his character and sets a fine example. Believing it was his duty to support his country in its decision for independence, Dickinson led a battalion of militia into the New Jersey front. He served only for a short time, desertions rendered his battalion useless, and because of his fears for his family as the British approached Philadelphia, he resigned his commission. He moved his family out of Philadelphia, the de facto capital of the United States at the time. His fear was well-founded. Despite his advocacy for reconciliation, his leadership in the resistance, and his once great influence over the country caused the loyalists to see him as a traitor. They looted his house in Dover, and the British burned his house in Philadelphia. Dickinson also received harsh treatment from his countrymen because of his unpopular stance on independence. Patriots harassed him and forcibly confiscated his property. Jeez, he can't get a break. The Pennsylvania Revolutionary Government issued threats of arrest against him, charging that he had not voted in support of independence, that he objected to the new Pennsylvania Constitution, that he deserted his militia unit, and that he advised his brother, a general in the Delaware militia, not to accept continental currency. Dickinson traveled to Philadelphia to face the charges, but the Council of Safety, which exercised executive authority, avoided meeting with him. Determined to prove his patriotism, in 1777, Dickinson did something nearly unheard of for a man of his status. He enlisted in the Delaware militia as a private, and with a musket upon his shoulder, he served at the Battle of Brandywine. He was soon promoted to Brigadier General, a commission he resigned later that year. Dickinson is one of the only two members of the First Continental Congress who actively took up arms during the war. In 1777, being Delaware's wealthiest farmer and largest slave owner, Dickinson decided to free his slaves conditionally. They would work for him for an additional 21 years, then after that, he would free them. However, later on, he decided to reverse this decision and he fully freed his slaves in 1786. While Dickinson only had 37 slaves, this was no doubt a commendable action. It is certain that the strongly abolitionist Quaker influences had an effect on him. 
John Dickinson was the only founding father to free his slaves in the period of 1776 to 1786. On January 18, 1779, Dickinson was appointed to be a delegate for Delaware to the Continental Congress. During his term, he signed the Articles of Confederation, having in 1776 authored the first draft while serving in the Continental Congress as a delegate from Pennsylvania. In October of 1781, Dickinson was elected to represent Kent County in the State Senate, and shortly afterwards, the Delaware General Assembly elected him the President of Delaware. The General Assembly's vote was nearly unanimous. The only dissenting vote had been casted by Dickinson himself. On November 7, 1782, a joint ballot by the Council and the Pennsylvania General Assembly elected Dickinson as President of the Council and thereby President of Pennsylvania. After his service in Pennsylvania, Dickinson returned to Delaware and lived in Wilmington. He was quickly appointed to represent Delaware at the Annapolis Convention. Side note, the convention was a meeting of 12 delegates from 5 U.S. states, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Virginia, to discuss and develop a consensus on reversing the protectionist trade barriers that each state had enacted. At the time, under the Articles of Confederation, each state was largely independent from the others, and the national government was powerless to regulate trade between the states. Delaware also sent Dickinson as one of its delegates to the Constitutional Convention of 1787. There, he supported the effort to create a strong central government, but he also asserted that each state, regardless of size, would have an equal vote in the future United States Senate. As he had done with the articles, he had also carefully drafted it with the term person rather than man, as was used in the Declaration of Independence. He prepared initial drafts of the First Amendment. Dickinson was one of the few delegates to vocally object to the slave trade on moral grounds and moved to have it prohibited in the Constitution. This motion resulted in Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution, which imposed sanctions on and prohibited the importation of slaves after 1808. Following the convention, he promoted the Constitution in a series of nine essays, written under the pen name Fabius. Dickinson died in Wilmington, Delaware, February 14, 1808. Thomas Jefferson, upon hearing the news of Dickinson's death, said, A more estimable man or truer patriot could not have left us. Among the first of the advocates for the rights of his country, while assailed by Great Britain, he continued to the last the orthodox advocate of true principles of our new government, and his name will be consecrated in history as one of the great worthies of the revolution. John Dickinson was an important man, that is without a doubt. However, his opposition to the signing of the Declaration of Independence really put the final nail in the coffin regarding his reputation. John Dickinson, despite his personal views, was essentially dragged into the revolution and the subsequent founding of the United States. I do believe, however, that his actions show a considerable commitment to the nation. All of this just goes to show that the founding of the United States was not as unanimous as we may think. The founding fathers debated almost every single topic, even the issue of independence itself. This just goes to show the complexity of history and how it's much more nuanced than we may think. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for watching. This is my first video, so expect more to come in the future. And I'd like to just say thank you to the folks at the John Dickinson Plantation at the Delaware Department of Culture and Historical Affairs. Uh, thank you for allowing me to film on site. This site is open to the public and is free admission, so come on down and visit whenever you want. Thank you.